Well, as we said, welcome to the multifamily real estate marketing webinar presented by myself, Tal and Lauren. We're really excited to have everyone here. The webinar agenda for today is going to, we're going to start with talking about branding. We're going to move into website, uh, continue into ongoing marketing game plan and, and tactics, resources, and sales. And at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session. So feel free to submit questions as we go or hold on to them to the end. We'll definitely be sticking around to answer questions at the end if that's a better format for you guys. So with that, we're going to jump right into branding. Um, so how to create a brand that resonates with your ideal tenants. So every building, every property has an ideal tenant base. Um, some are looking for you know, there's different types of people, different price points, different things that speak to them. So how do you create a brand that resonates? Um, so for starters, a brand is way more than just a logo. It's the physical experience. It's the reputation. It's the tenant community. It's everything that your community and the surrounding city thinks about your property when they hear the name. So the logo is just one small piece of it. I want to think through sometimes a property might not need a new brand and sometimes it might. So some of the things that we see, you know, the question of when to create a new brand, um, when we want to change the community perception. So if for some reason we need to change the public's opinion of, of something, um, we want to attract a new audience. So maybe if there's an audience that typically has thought this is a good fit and we want to attract somebody else or communicate to somebody new. Um, if we want to communicate new experiences, new investments are putting, being put into a property, maybe new amenities, um, there's a, a physical new experience to talk about, or if there's a, just a new message. Um, sometimes this comes with ownership change often. Um, Tall and Lauren, I don't know if you guys have ex, you know, examples or thoughts on when the optimal time is to choose to create a new brand versus kind of leaning into an existing one, um, but these are some of the things that we see. Yeah, I was going to mention that even for like a lot of the buildings that we're targeting value add uh, multifamily buildings. So properties that are a lot of times mom and pop owned, they don't take good care of the properties, don't take good care of the tenants, there's deferred maintenance, there's not a good like mass head reputation in the city regarding your building, you know, and, and living there. So the fact that you create a new brand, tell people what you're doing, what you're do putting into the property, it can really help change that you know pretty drastically and pretty quickly actually really elevate everything yeah because once people know that they're going to kind of throw out what they thought about it before and go experience it you know for themselves firsthand yep so when we look into developing a new brand for a property there's three steps that we kind of go through and three core elements that we that we look at so the first is brand strategy and messaging so we always want to think about the strategy first. If you're targeting, if you're in a lower class neighborhood, developing a luxury brand that's going to make everything seem like it's gold plated is not going to be the right fit. So we need to think through who the target audience is, who the buyer profile is, and start to craft messaging and, and a brand structure that's going to appeal to that audience. So the first step is always strategy. And the strategy is really hinged on thinking through who we want to attract and how we're going to attract them. The next step is the visual identity. This is what everybody thinks about. This is the logo, the colors, the fun things, the, the guide kind of how the brand will actually visually communicate how it will look. And the third piece is the touch points and the experience. So this is when we have the messaging, we have the strategy, we have the brand, and now we have a logo, we have colors, and we have all these things. Now we need to put that on stuff. Um, so this is creating experiences, creating sales resources, creating the website, which will be the next topic and, you know, print resources and signage um, to support the sales process. So some examples, I have some examples in here from Key Tower. That was one of the projects that our agency uh, worked on the, uh, a big rebrand. Um, it, it isn't an apartment building, but it is an example of a major uh, shift in the, in opinion and a major investment in a building. Um, and they did want to go the luxury route. So to develop a luxury brand um, for Key Tower. So business cards, um, this is just a logo, um, but sales folders and collateral brochures, all these things that you can use once you develop the branded assets to actually carry it through everything and create a sales experience that really um, it, it promotes the brand you're trying to create. Um, Tall and Lauren, what, what brand branded resources and things do you see as most valuable? I mean, it, it really, I think is going to depend on the, on the size of the asset, right? So once you get yeah. into like 
70, 80 plus unit buildings, you're going to have like a little uh, on-site leasing office. So that's like when tenants come in, it could be anything from a, like this little sales folder right here, pop up banner stand when they walk in to, it gives them the instant feel. They're not just walking into another apartment building. Right. It's all time they can take and give out and things like that. Because they're going to go see five different buildings. It's like going to see a house. You want them to remember your apartment building. It's like all about the experience from when you walk in, even from when you drive onto the property. Yeah, the sign is a big deal, I think. When you're rebranding, the right. when you take over management, a new sign is huge. Yep. And just even. The, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, even just like the, you know, now open with a big new logo, something simple that just communicates that there's something new and fresh going on can be a simple start um, to kind of announcing it. Yeah. And I remember when I saw the key tower stuff at uh, like the folder and the pamphlets that you made, I was like really impressed. And I thought I was like, wow, like I can't believe not everybody's doing this because it was the first time I had seen something like that. And it made me remember key tower. Right. Right. Yeah. Branding is super important. And and branding is something that I think that um, I'm really excited to be kind of promoting and presenting the, the concept of branding in this way to the real estate market, because I think it's something that's kind of been missed where um, there is an opportunity to develop these strong brands and create communities that have have a brand they can tie to and be proud to live at. Um, and, and sometimes it's overlooked. And I think there's a huge opportunity there um, when people are looking to create these new experiences in a building to also pair that with a brand that the residents would be proud of and excited about. Yeah, and that's like what's most important for us. Like when we're taking over these buildings, we want to create a place people love to live. Like it's not just like, they come home and they leave and they go, they're proud to call this place home. Um, right. and they love it. And so like, that's whole, that's, that's the difference between people who really take care of their tenants and who don't, I think. And I think yeah. it's also very interesting. Like you said, Matt, a lot of these um, people think it's not important. Like the, the branding for real estate is overlooked. It's like, if you break it down, like look at Starbucks is the most basic example. They don't have the best coffee but they have the best branding, the best experience. And that's why they're the most popular coffee. I don't even drink coffee, but I go there for meetings anyways. You know, it's uh, it, it's the experience they create for their yeah. customers. Yep. Yeah. And, and by um, a lot of these branding projects are happening in the process while people are investing in creating new experiences. So it only makes sense to kind of also pair that with a brand, in my opinion, my marketing opinion. <laughs> So, all right, let's keep going on. Um, are there any questions about branding or any comments that you guys have? If you please drop them, if you have them. Um, so let's get into websites. Um, how to build an effective website to capture leads and support sales. So the way I have this framed is kind of through some questions. Um, the first thing I would, I would invite people to think about when they're evaluating their own website or considering making a new website is the content. So does your website have the information people are looking for? Um, from our experience, the clients we work with and the pages that we're seeing get the most traffic, obviously it has to have branding and messaging that represents the building, but then people really wanna see photos and videos. They really wanna see floor plans. They wanna see the amenities in the building. They wanna be able to find pricing, even if it's not for their specific unit, something to see if this is a ballpark place they'd actually wanna live without jumping through hoops. And then simple things like the address and the contact information. Um, this is the stuff that that we're seeing. Um, I I think that one of the the biggest things we've done is just making floor plans available for people. Um, floor plans, helping people envision themselves in the space, um, is invaluable. And especially now, kind of moving into the COVID era, more resources online is you know help people make that decision. Is there anything you guys would add as far as resources for content? Yeah, I mean, not really. You know, I think a big thing here is also in the amenities um, and more like Lauren was saying, the tenant experience. So yeah. they're going to get the photo, video, floor pans, but if you're doing community events, you know, people a lot of times want to live in a community. You know, they don't want to just be, this is my one little apartment. I'm going to come, I'm going to go. They want to have neighbors. And it's only if you move into a neighborhood, it's a community, you know, you know, your neighbors across the street, you're friendly with people. Oftentimes that's, you know, if you're looking at five buildings that are exactly the same, same amenities, same floor plans, everything, they're going to go to where they feel, feel the, the most at home, yeah. feel the best and the place they can call, you know, really a community and home. It's always like starts from the front door. So it's like, 
people can make the units really nice, but you got to make like, like the entryway. Like when you walk in there, the mailboxes are nice. The floor is nice. Like it's all about the second you drive onto the property and then walk into that door. Yep. And kind of just to, to piggyback on that, I totally agree as far as the, the experience in the building and the website should just be an extension of that. So the website is often the first touch that somebody has when they're looking up your building or they're trying to decide if this is where they want to live. They're gathering information and they're kind of in that consideration stage of trying to figure out their options. Um, and the website should extend exactly what Lauren is saying, extend that experience onto, you know, onto the internet so that people have a great experience from the first time they're experiencing your building. Um, so that's a perfect segue into the next thing, which is what's the user experience actually using the website? Um, so a lot of issues that we see are mobile performance issues where things are not adjusting properly when you're looking at them on your phone or a tablet. Um, site speed, really slow sites have really high bounce rates and they don't get, they get, you know, dispreferential treatment. They get lowered in rank by Google. Um, information organization. So how hard is it to find the organization? How many clicks does it take? Um, kind of like how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? How many clicks does it take to get to what you want? Um, that's kind of the way we think about it. We try to make things really simple. Um, so form simplicity. If you're asking for information, you're asking for someone to submit, how simple is that form? How easy is it for them? Because if it's really complex, you're missing the boat. People are just going to leave without submitting when they might have if it was more simple. Um, and clear next steps. So that's the call to action on the page. That's saying, hey, we want to talk to you. Here's a button to click. Here's the next step to take if you want a lease. Here's how you can get in touch with us. Um, so giving people that path online so they know exactly what they're supposed to do and not leaving it kind of in an ambiguous place where they come, they're reading, and then they leave without knowing. And then the results. So ultimately, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the most important thing. Is the website doing its job? And for me, we kind of qualify that in, in some different ways. The first is, is it attracting the right audience? So a lot of people talk about SEO. This is SEO. SEO is how many people are organically searching online and finding your website. If your website's or uh, developed properly and is set up in the correct way, you're going to be set up to rank when people are looking for you and show up when people are searching for your name. If your website's not set up correctly, you might not be getting the traffic you should. Um, converting leads. So once you have, let's say you're bringing a thousand visitors to your website, how many of those people are actually filling out a form and becoming somebody that you can reach out to and say, hey, are you actually interested? I'd love to talk to you. Um, so we're constantly trying to convert leads. We have great success actually getting people to fill out forms and, and show interest for apartment um, opportunities. And there's there's definitely this, there's a chance to get leads from um, websites online um, for this stuff. And the last thing is supporting the leasing process. So we always try to make sure the website is a sales tool. So anybody who's involved in the leasing process can point anybody in the conversation. Hey, we've got that on this page. Let me follow up with you in an email. Let me send you that. Let me send you this. Um, let me show you pictures. You should go to our website. We've got a video of that. Um, how useful is the website actually as a tool just in conversation to show on a screen um, all the things you'd want to talk about in the sales process. And so that is one of the jobs that a website has in this um, in the sales process that we experience. Um, how do you guys use use websites? What are your thoughts on this, Tal and Lauren? I was actually going to ask what you think or would have seen on, for like forms versus like a phone number. Do people who are like leads tend to just fill out the forms more or take action and actually call directly? Yeah, so um, it it's it depends on the property. And it depends on the um, the audience, but th we definitely are getting form submissions and click to call both. Um, so depending on the property, sometimes it's 50 50. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think when it's when it's an older audience, and this is a really rough generalization, but I think older audiences are quicker to do a click to call younger audiences are maybe fishing with the forms and doing the more mobile friendly process mm -hmm. rather than picking up the phone and, and calling and having a conversation with the person. Um, I think it's a little bit generational. Uh, but yeah, to your point, it's really important to give both paths and make it really easy. Yeah. So, um, and that also comes in 
I, it, that's a great thing to mention. I didn't even put it in for, with, with the Google ads. Um, but when you're running advertisements, you can promote click to call too, which is a great point. And something I was going to say, um, when you're, when a lot of people are going to be watching this, oh, well, my building's fully occupied. You know, I don't need this. I don't need that. The thing is, I mean, it's very overlooked also in the real estate space. The biggest expense you can have that's kind of unknown is turnover. Right. So the second you have an empty unit, you want someone lined up to jump right back in there. This will help you build a waiting list. So like, for example, we have an apartment coming up in December. It's already leased. You know, it comes up end of this month. We're going to go and renovate it for a month. And then it's going to be released already. It's because we have the advertising. Everything is set up. And they know what they're going to get into, even though they haven't seen the unit itself. They have the price point, they have the range, pictures, pictures like. and everything yeah. that they you know want to know. So the, the key is having a wait list of people to continuously fill the pipeline. Because honestly, even if you have 100 people, 50 of those could have already found another apartment. Yeah, always leasing. And that comes back to like Sol was saying, uh, the leasing agents, having them tied into the website and the CRM or whatever that looks like. So it's a seamless, continuous process for everybody. Yep. So just a few, you know, visual examples. I think this is a great, so depending on your budget, this is a, a great example where this is a big, beautiful drone shot. If you can drone footage videos is great. A big button that says view our availabilities. That could be a big call to action that says something about, you know, your building or lease now, if you've got open spots, um, making sure it renders correctly on mobile and across all the platforms um, is really important. We have a so, question if you guys want to answer. Yes, it. absolutely. Um, so Bernie says, um, at what point in multifamily do you feel that running branding and a marketing campaign such as this would be useful? In other words, uh, at what point is too small to go through this? Sure. Um, that's a great question. So I think that there's, 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 um, it's kind of a two-part answer. So the, the, the branding and the website are one-time expenses. And to me, um, it's a fixed cost that you can budget in at the beginning of a project. And, and that comes down to, I think, when cost is a limiting factor to do it, you can't do it. Um, but I would advise for a property that can afford it to build a brand and a website at the, as soon as possible. Um, and then the ongoing marketing stuff, which we're going to get into next is really a sliding scale of, of how much you need to do and how much you can afford to do. Um, and it's really a budget thing. It, it, it's really a, a conversation of budget and goals. Um, I think that, you know, just to honestly give, give some rough numbers, you know, it's the, to do a brand and a website is in the, it's in the tens of thousands of dollars to do it correctly. Um, but it's a one-time cost. And then when you get into advertising ongoing, depending on whether you're engaging in an agency or you're hiring somebody to do it yourself, um, that structure, the actual ad dollars for the paid part is pretty minimal, um, to, to get a high impact, you know, hundreds of dollars a month plus paying for the service to get it done, whether it's an, an intern or an employee or an agency or what the structure is um, to actually launch the advertisements and, and get the work done. So I think cost is the biggest limiting factor and also the goals of, of like how much your interest you're really trying to drum up. But brand and website to me is kind of an essential part of investing. It, like if, if it was me, um, you know, I, I would be doing it as like not a duplex maybe, but like a 10, 10 units or something. Um, pretty small. I would say it's probably worth it. Yeah. And something I want to add on to that. Um, <laughs> we actually had someone else ask us the same question I was going to ask later on. But for example, a 22 unit we have, um, we don't have a website set up. We didn't have it structured into the budget originally. Yeah. But with that being said, like I was saying, a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't need this. My building's 100 occupied. Some people say if your building is 100 percent occupied, you you know your rents are too low. You know if you have this image and and this website and everything, you're driving so much more traffic than the 10 guys down the street from you. Then you know that makes up for it right there. If you can get an extra 10, 20 dollars a month because of your branding and your website and everything, it'll make up for it across 20 units over a year's time span. That adds up really quickly. So. 
And I would say there's always cheaper ways to do things depending on your goals and depending on the scope of the project. So, um, you know, for that price point is me thinking about a key tower project, doing something way smaller and simpler is way smaller and simpler. Mm -hmm. Um, Working with not an agency and working with a person who's, you know, your friend who can make you a logo might be better than the logo that you have now. And it might be $50. Um, You know, so I think that, it's, it's important to be thinking about these things always. And then based on your budget, we can, you can kind of determine what the best path forward is to execute. And I think uh, the, or like a really good time, one, like once marketing thing, like you were saying, like definitely the brand and the website is so important to drive that traffic, but then the sign, like just like investing in a sign is that's marketing for the duration of ownership. It's right there in the front and it will distinguish you against everybody else on that street. And people know that there's a new sheriff in town. New that's, sheriff in town. That's what you say. You know, it's it's like when we come in, we want to do that. We want to make sure yeah. the, the parking lot's looking good. You got a new sign, now leasing, new management, you know, whatever that looks like. So people driving by like, oh, that place used to be a dump. Now I want to go see what's going on there. Newly renovated units. Like, what do those look like? You know? There's a lot, what we've seen in the marketplace, there's not a lot of quality, uh, affordable. affordable places for people to live in the apartment space. You're going to see a lot of slumlords, a lot of people, mom and pops that are cleaning carpet and just wiping things down and, you know, getting almost top the dollar rents. So what we do, you know, we come in, create a clean, safe, affordable place for people to call home. And, uh, you know, it's kind of just what we were talking about before. It's for us, it's the key to everything. And I'm, I'm big on the sign. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the sign's huge, right? Phys- the, absolutely physical marketing is, is huge and it, it does kind of plant your flag that you're there and people need to see it. You can't do all this stuff online and have the old sign up. It, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, definitely is, is the sign is definitely worth the investment. I totally agree. hundred um, percent. So thank you for that question, Bernie. That was great. Um, let's keep, I'm going to keep going here. Um, I hope that was a useful answer. Um, (laughs) how to create a marketing game plan to attract and convert leads. I think ultimately this is what we're talking about, whether your building is full or you're trying to build that wait list of people who are interested. Um, it's attracting people and converting them to be interested in getting their information. So this is really marketing. This is the real marketing campaign stuff that we talk about on a monthly basis you should be thinking about. So Google. Um, Google first and foremost is one of, is if not the best, one of the best places to be advertising. It's where you can capture your audience while they're actively searching. So they're searching apartment building in Cleveland, Ohio or apartments near me or where do I live? Um, All those keywords and things that people would search we, it starts to pull up buildings and people start to rank. Um, so the first thing I would mention with Google is on the organic side, there's something called Google My Business, which is a tool that businesses and organizations use. It basically creates a portfolio or a um, like a page for your business. Um, it's where your search and your maps show up. It includes the information and reviews. Here's a picture, an example of what this looks like. I'm sure it's very familiar to you guys when you're looking for things. This is kind of what pops up. So you have an opportunity to build this for your building. Um, So if you have not gone into Google and registered correctly with your Google My Business profile, you don't have one of these pages correctly. And it's going to hurt when people are searching. You come up on maps, how the reviews show up, you know this whole procedure, you want this to be set up correctly. Um, So that's the first thing I'd recommend is make sure the Google My Business page is set up. That's something everybody can kind of look into and do either for free or very cheap support. Um, And really you just build it out with your company's information and get it registered. And then you'll, it it will help your search engine optimization get going right away. And I want to add something to that. Sorry, Lauren. No, we've had good traction doing that. A lot of good traction. And also, with this, you're gonna see a lot of times, they were talking about creating the new image, like the mom and pop shops, you're gonna see here one stars, two stars. They don't answer my maintenance calls. They don't do this, they don't do that. And then once you start to get new tenants, new people in there, you can you know, push people towards that website and say, hey, how are we doing? Can you leave us a review, et cetera, et cetera. So then the people coming you know, fresh can see, oh, this has now been turned around. They don't just see one or two stars and run away. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And I, and that's a great point. Um, that it's perfect time to mention, ask, like, 
talking to people and asking for for the five star review as part of your sales process if you close if you close a new tenant if if you have this set up and you can ask for a review and build up those five stars that's going to be massive for your brand. Um, if you have a ton of five-star reviews sitting on your Google My Business page, it is extremely powerful for your business. So it's not something to be overlooked. And if there are physical things you can work into your process, I mean, I know we work with an attorney and after he, after he closes the, you know, after he gets those people paid, he says, hey, were you happy with us? Can you leave us a review? And it's great. And he, you know, and he's crushing it with the five-star reviews in that way. And I think that there's an opportunity here with, you know, if you're providing great service, if you have the opportunity to have outreach, um, to ask for those, those reviews, um, like Tal was saying, to kind of overcome the past impressions that might be sitting there. Um, it could be huge. So paid advertising, um, this is a really great opportunity also. So this is where you pay to rank at the top of Google for specific keywords. So you can really do your research and understand what your audience is searching for, what your competitors are, are paying for. Um, you can really get in the weeds and understand the metrics behind how people are paying for ads and how you can rank against them. So I wanna show you guys an example of a, a real, um, these are real ads. Um, maybe not exactly the picture I pulled, but these are real metrics. Um, from an ad we were running for an apartment building in July. And just to give you guys kind of a feel of, of, of how far your money can stretch and what kind of an impact it can create. So if you spend we spent $152 on Google ads for this client on this specific ad, it led to a 64 cent cost per click. That means every time a person clicks on the ad, we're paying 64 cents. Um, we actually ended up with a, a conversion rate of 5%, which is really great in this industry. And we ended up with 12 leads. So these were 12 people that actually came from Google. They were looking for one of the keywords we're advertising for, which are specific to apartments in the city or something that we're choosing. They're clicking on this link, getting taken to a specific landing page that we've built and choosing to fill out a form that basically says, hey, I'm interested. Um, so that was 12 people in one month for $152. That's, we're really excited about those results when we see that from Google. Um, I don't know, Tal and Lauren, do you guys have? Do you yes, guys something I wanted to say here. It's really crucial how, like you said before, so the initial investment is going to be in the website and the branding. But this, let's say you have a unit coming up next month, you turn this on. You know, you don't need to be running this the whole time, right? You can just turn this on, turn this off when you see fit, which is like, I mean, it's so valuable. So I was saying, like, you don't want a unit sitting vacant for one day. You want someone the same day, you want to go in, clean it, release it the next day. That's the goal. Right. Yep. Yeah. The, the Google ads are, are super powerful um, and they really are capturing people, right? They're capturing people when they're searching. So this is where capturing people, when they have the intent of, they're actually looking to make a decision. Um, and they're, they're searching for their option. They're, they're, they're in that search consideration phase, maybe decision stage, they're ready to go. Um, and so we really have, have had a great, um, experience running Google AdWords. And it's also a really approachable, something I'd add is it's very approachable and easy for someone to kind of tiptoe into. And you do, it does not require a social media presence, um, which is really important because a lot of people, you, you have a new building, you're, you're just getting going with all of this stuff, building content, trying to develop a following on social media might sound really intimidating. This is something that's completely disconnected from social media. It doesn't matter what your Facebook page looks like. This can drive leads completely outside of that environment. So we're going to talk about social media, but I think it's important to note that this is a great way that kind of, if you don't have the time, energy, effort, budget, all those things to tackle all of this all at once, you can turn on Google ads and start driving results pretty quickly. Um, so YouTube. So YouTube is something that we've been um, having success with also. And YouTube is, is really interesting because YouTube drives top of funnel awareness. Um, and so we do get clicks. Um, we are getting, we, you will see that we got, you know, 85 clicks, which means 85 people came from this ad and went to the website. But the number that we're really excited about here when we're, we're at least for this client is the 39,500 impressions, because what's happening is, is we're, we're building brand awareness in this community. We're doing very specific targeting. This ad is being shown to 39,000 people people. It's being shown 39,000 times in a month. And what happens is, is we're starting to see our Google results start to gain more traction because more people are starting to search 
in the area for the property because we're partnering that with awareness ads on YouTube. So again, this is kind of a nice way where we can start to build a funnel where we're building mass awareness on YouTube through impressions, engagement. We are driving some website visits. We're only spending $100 to do this, by the way, actually an ad dollars out to spend on YouTube. Um, and then that in turn, those 39,000 people are gonna start to understand the brand exists when they're in the pattern of thinking about buying, maybe now they're searching and we start to see better results on Google because we're doing this awareness stuff on YouTube. Did we just get a question? Yeah, let's see what this is here. Uh, Michael asks, if you have multiple buildings, but also use third-party management, does it still make sense to have a website for each building? If so, would leads be directed to your property management company? Yes. So um, the way that we've historically structured things is to have each building, each building that is its own building and brand and, and has its own space, you know, maybe if there's two next to each other, that's a different story, but each building living experience, having its own website, and we can funnel the leads and the information, the contacts that come into any of the marketing campaigns, wherever we want. So that all can get funneled to one place. It all could get funneled to one person, person's inbox um, or into one database. Um, it could get segmented into a database where it comes in and it's tagged per property into one system. So there's lots of ways for us to kind of slice and dice the information and move it around once it's in the system. But on the outward presence, we do typically recommend a brand and a website for each building. And then a lot of times, you know, I know, uh, I think you guys do this as well. Um, let's say someone goes to that one building's website they say, I want to <clears throat> apply now, you know, for a lease or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. That'll then take them to the tenant portal that's most likely on the property management original right. website. Absolutely. So that's a great point with, with the website stuff. A lot of the property management stuff that like there, there's a tenant portal, um, that kind of functionality, we just link out to that. So that all stays exactly the same as is with the existing systems. And we just create a, a nice clean button that says, here's, here's where you click to go to that portal or whatever, um, and, and send people out to that. So yeah, we, we definitely integrate in that way with the portals. Um, that's very common. Great question. Thank you. Um, so very similar conversation to YouTube, um, actually less trackable, um, but also very interesting for specific markets or for specific audiences. Um, so there's an opportunity now actually through spectrum, um, is who we've been using it to run commercials, short commercials, um, through TV and streaming. Um, and it gives you the opportunity they have because they are managing the uh, set boxes in everyone's homes. And they also have touch into the streaming services and they've partnered with the streaming, the, all of the major streaming services. Um, they have a ton of data that they're able to kind of pair up. If you know who your audience profile is and who you're trying to advertise to, what channels they're look, they, they'd be watching, what times they'd be watching, all of these things. Um, and you can get really specific and choose to run awareness ads. And it's the same concept where you're trying to drum up awareness in a community and inspire that search. And then we would be trying to capture them on the search um, and also social media, which will be coming next. But the idea is top of funnel awareness with, with commercials, if you have the budget um, in the communities, and it doesn't have to be a super high budget um, to be on specific channels. Um, specific platforms, specific communities. It's by, it's all by region. Um, so this is an interesting one. It's not something that we're, you know, doing all the time, but for certain opportunities, it, it is a great thing to consider. So this is kind of tall. Lauren already kind of gave a sneak peek to this one, but um, one of the biggest things in, in our marketing game plans that we're developing is the structure for events and experiences. Um, and we're pushing and kind of through the lens of marketing, asking to come up with the events and experiences that are really great for tenants, create that community, but also 
give us a footing for marketing. So they give us something to talk about um, in all of the, that social media content, those emails, all those things. Um, it gives us some, you know, some meat just to stop, you know, not only talk about the pool or the amenity, you know, the gym, um, have a little more to talk about the, the chef that's going to be doing a demo or, you know, the event that's in the lobby that we're doing something special for the Browns game or whatever it is. Um, it could be anything. But having a, a structure to create events and experiences and then promote them is something I wanted to bring up because it, it really it kind of becomes the core of the marketing plan for a lot of these buildings. Yeah. It helps you stand apart, you know, yeah. more than anything, too. It's like back to what we were saying with the community. Little touches like that. Exactly. It doesn't cost much. It could be a right. pizza party, yeah. you know, barbecue outside, you're cooking burgers for the resident. Like silly little things like that that bring people together. And they really appreciate it. You know, little things like that go a long way because 99 out of 100, the other buildings they lived in, they never did that. Yep, absolutely. And kind of just to, to move into social media, it's a perfect segue because all of those things at any little event, just take a cookout. If you were to grill up some burgers, take a picture of it, post on social media. Now you got three pictures. Now you got two posts. Now you got all this content because you had an event. Maybe you, you run an ad that talks about the event. So the more people know the event's coming. Um, so that's where these events kind of become the framework for having stuff to talk about and stuff to do on social media. Um, the idea behind social media is building a presence on these platforms to connect with your audience and, and build that community like Tom and Lauren are talking about. Um, primarily what we've seen, the, the platforms we're using are Facebook and Instagram. Um, Snapchat definitely still is a platform, but we're, we're still figuring out kind of how to best utilize it. Um, but we've had a lot of success on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I think it's great to cover the two types of content that we launch on social media and that's organic and paid. So organic means you are just posting and it's getting shown to your audience. Those are the people that you are connected to or like your page. Paid is where we are posting something that we're paying to put it in front of specific audiences with a budget and it's an advertisement and that expands your reach on social media. So there's always a combination of you want to have ongoing organic content that shows you exist. It shows what kind of a community you have you have. It shows what's going on, but then leveraging paid to kind of break past that circle and attract new audiences to get eyes on your page. So for organic content, some of the best stuff we've seen working people that are engaging with and interested in learning about the amenities, the staff, personal stories about the staff, a staff highlight is awesome. Events and experiences, like we said, deals and promotions. If this goes without saying, marketing comes with deals and promotions. People get excited about deals. So if you have the opportunity to structure some little $50 off or an incentive on the down payment to get started or, you know, anything, those are all opportunities to promote through social media and all the other platforms, um, but on social media and also building communities. So highlighting what's going on in your community, trying to spur conversations, talking about what's going on in the building is great. Um, that's, that's a perfect place for organic content. So paid advertising, this is what we were talking about with the targeting method. So there's different ways to break past your audience and target new audiences with paid advertising on social media. So retargeting is a great one. Retargeting pairs with our tactics of awareness ads and Google ads because retargeting will put a Facebook or Instagram ad in front of anybody that's been to our website and left and came back to social media. So that's a really powerful one because that's an engaged audience that we know they've already been exposed. They're already interested in some way because they've come to your apartment building website. For some reason, they've browsed around. We could be as specific you know, as getting to a certain page if we want of maybe that you know went to the availabilities page or something. Um, but anybody that took this action online, we're going to show, we're going to create an audience and show them an ad on Facebook or Instagram. And this is an example of an Instagram ad that's kind of just a video tour um, that says, hey, this is what, you know, this is what it looks like, a little tour, learn more. Um, so those are really cool. That's a really great way to be specific with how you're spending money on Facebook. So you're not just targeting a wide audience. You're only paying to go in front of people that have actually been to your site and know something about you already. 
Um, geotargeting is a great thing to bring up because that's where you can limit by specific actual geography. So if you are really only targeting people within a five or 10 mile radius of your building, you know that you want a local market or you want to really dominate the local market with a specific message, you can geotarget and choose to promote an ad only in a specific area, which is cool. And then there's interest in demographics. So depending on the property and depending on, you know, for us, the products, but we can target based on interests and, and demographics. And there's a laundry list of different factors we can choose, but you know, some things would be like, if you know that you want to, you know, bring in sports fans to live somewhere in Cleveland, because it's right near Brown stadium, we could be targeting people that are fans of the Browns. We could be targeting people in a certain age range. We could be targeting people. We could be targeting all women and we could be targeting, you right. Like there, there's all these different ways that we can segment and choose how we place an ad. Um, and so that's, you know, that kind of gets into the brand strategy of, of why we, we do that brand strategy first. So we understand who our target market is, and then we can kind of get savvy with the way we launch paid advertising. So email, email is a great platform to stay in front of your audience. So a lot of times we see that there's not an immediate buying pattern. So sometimes people call and they're ready to go. Sometimes people are signing up for an email and they're sticking around for a little while. They're browsing. They're not sure. They're getting their information. They're, you know, it's a big decision. Maybe they're just starting the process. Um, so email is a great way to have an opportunity for somebody to, you know, to stay top of mind in someone's inbox, provide them this value. And the three ways that we provide value are providing entertainment, education, information, or deals and incentives. Those are the most valuable things you can provide. So honestly, sometimes we put jokes in our emails, try to make them entertaining, lighten them up a little bit. Like, hey, if you live here, it's going to be fun. Here's an email that shows things aren't so serious, right? So you can kind of add some personality and entertainment into your emails to give your property some personality before somebody actually might walk in the door. Um, education information, this could come education about the city is a big one. So helping people understand what's this, what's in the surrounding area and what it would be like, um, highlighting events, highlighting things that are close or that are going on is a great thing to do. And then deals and incentives. So if you've captured someone's email a month ago, they might've been interested following up with that deal that you're running now um, and making sure that your whole email list is on top of the promotions you're running is a great way to capture those people who are still kind of in that sitting in that consideration stage and aren't sure yet. They're trying to decide. So here's an example. Um, one thing that we haven't spoken about yet, and I think is is really important to touch on, is the the COVID stuff. Um, and so this kind of puts right at the beginning the COVID update, and, and this is their newsletter for this property. Um, so maintaining extremely transparent communication about COVID-19 procedures has been a massive initiative for every single property, every single business that we work with. So including that through this content, through emails, creating language and getting in front of the conversation and having a way to do it and a platform to do it is extremely powerful. Um, people want to know that you care. Everybody's dealing with the same situation. So no one's expecting it to, you to make it go away, but they are expecting to hear that you're respecting it, that you are trying to take the steps to protect them, that you are doing the right things, the right things that we all, you know, taking the steps to try and be cautious and try and provide the best experience for tenants. So communicating those things has been really important. And email has been one of the best ways that we've been kind of getting into the details. So we've, we've created you know, on the website, we created stuff on the website, we created social media posts, which are small snippets, but we really have gone deep with the emails and emailing out the procedures, the open rates on all of the COVID emails have been through the roof because everybody wants to know. Um, and so really diving deep and having an email platform to communicate is important. Um, and I guess email is a great place to talk about that little piece. <laughs> and the one thing I do want to say, it's so crucial to have your email list built and continuing to build it before something like COVID happens. Because if COVID hits, you're like, oh shit, I need an email list. It, something could happen next week that could be the next COVID, God forbid. But like, if you don't have that already, you're just gonna be like scrambling to, to catch up. You wanna enter your system always. Right, yep. 
Yeah, and one more thing, like you said, with the with the coronavirus and everything going on, people don't want to walk through the you know thing with a leasing agent. They want to be as virtual as possible. Yeah. And everything we talk about tonight, the website, you know, uh, applying for a lease online, the the layouts, and the photos, photos, the pricing, yeah. they know without actually seeing it, what they're exactly what they're getting into. Yeah. So that's, that's perfect. That's exactly the next topic is adapting the sales process to sign more leases. And exactly where my thought process is, is what's going on with COVID. I would love to hear you guys um, speak to this. I kind of touched on this transparent communication about precautions being super important. Um, One thing we've done is, is we really rapidly launched the opportunity for virtual tours both for people to schedule a live one where they can actually have a FaceTime tour with a person and pre-recorded where we actually, you know, had a rep do a tour as if they were with somebody and turned it into a video and posted it so that people could get access to that at any time. Um, what else, what else are you guys seeing? I think I had one more slide here. Um, contact free leasing. This is kind of the stuff yeah. you were starting to get into. I would love to hear your experience with what's working here. Yeah, I mean, really, people want to know, like you said, that you're keeping the place, first of all, clean, that you have a cleaner coming in a few times a month or like once a week to make sure services are cleaned off, doors, you know, everything like that, because that's obviously very top of mind for everyone. Make sure your leasing agents and staff are on board with everything, you know, like for, for our leasing agents, they're not... A lot of times going into the units, even with the tenants, they're just letting you know? them in and letting them walk through. Letting them own. in, they're even yeah. doing, like you said, uh, like a, a FaceTime saying, Hey, here's the unit, this is what it is, this is what it looks like. Here's the bathroom, here's the kitchen. You know, they see the pictures online, they have the website, all the tools are provided to them. It's not like, Oh, well, if you want it, you'll come. You know what I mean? It's like, No, we're going to help you feel comfortable, safe in order to, you know, feel good enough to sign this lease on the website help you know them what make I mean? a decision that works for them you know it's going to work for them or not but we can give them all the information that they need to decide that for themselves exactly. yep and so i guess the last thing that i would love to get into with you guys that i see as an opportunity for marketing and sales to kind of work together to develop to develop systems is in the follow-up process um and in in the list building so we capture the lead and now what happens right so the lead came into the website the person says hey my name's matt I'm, I'm interested. Um, here's my email address. Now what happens? So there's a lot of steps that, that can be organized um, to both track the lead and create a sequence that kind of automates steps or just creates a checklist for you of things to do and reminders for a sales rep to make sure that there's as high a close rate as possible on these people who are actively expressing interest. Um, that's one of the things that I see um, the ball get dropped the most is that we get these awesome lists and we're trying to close sales. And then the follow-up process on the list is just not smooth or it's not tracked correctly, or there's not a system in place for it. So I would love to hear kind of what, what your guys' recommendations are or what you guys do to help close leads the best um, once we capture them. Yeah. I mean, it's OPs. I mean, it's really follow-up is key. You know, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. Like I was saying before, you have 100 people on a wait list. Now, three weeks later, you have a unit that comes available. 50% of those are going to be out the window. But if you're not following up those people actively, you won't know where they're at. You'll just say, oh, you know, I don't really feel like following up. I don't really remember. I don't have the information. That's why I think the SOPs are the most important. You have the standard procedures that you know what to do. Like you were saying, so well, it's X, Y, Z, and you do it no matter what. That way you don't have to think about it even. You're like, a lead comes in, and this is what I do. And that's it. You I think know, the CRM is really key too, because automated. then you, you know, you tag in your leasing agents, everyone that really is going to be making those follow-up phone calls and those emails. Yeah. And just, for, just for anyone listening, I, would, I just want to take a second because I know that not everybody knows what CRM is. Um, so a CRM system is a system that it's called a customer relationship management system. And what it is, is it's a system that creates a database as leads come into a system and creates, a, and it, it allows you to, uh, associate them into certain lists, uh, give them certain attributes and assign certain tasks. Different CRMs have different functionality, but it allows you to be extremely organized and not let anything fall through the cracks. So basically, instead of having an, a handwritten Excel spreadsheet or you know just a list that you're manually managing, there's ways to have an actual system that automates 
steps in the process and captures, it, it kind of combines what's coming in through all your lead generation efforts into one place so that sales can then go and attack it in the right way. Yeah. I think having that all set up in the back end, automating what you can, and then having those lists of things that you do when this happens or when that happens is the most important thing you can have. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, I know that everybody's got their own flow, emails, phone calls, there's different ways to create that sequence, but having a sequence is like you said, just having that procedure of the lead comes in, they're getting an email, then they're getting a call. Then if I haven't heard from them, they're going to get another call or they're going to get a follow-up email or whatever it is. You can set your own cadence that makes sense for you, um, but having it and making sure you stick to it and train on it and, and have a system to track it is extremely important. So this is the end. This is the, uh, that was the, the last slide that we've got planned here for you guys. So I guess, Tom, Lauren, do you have anything else? We'll open the floor up to questions. I'm really yeah, excited we, with kind of. We had a couple of questions from our audience. I mean, now looking at it, we hit on a bunch yeah. of them actually. Um, we basically hit all them. I guess we're just that good. Yeah. I didn't even see them. <laughs> No, that's this awesome. is from on the back end, what we've been getting over the past month or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, there was no collusion. He just happened to answer <laughs> oh. them. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> uh, I guess in general, I guess uh, this was a question that came up. Like people are just starting out. Let's say they didn't budget in. Um, it's Maybe it's like a fourplex and they want to like test out the waters. What's like the best and easiest, most cost effective way for someone to just have like the most simple website? Can they do just like a landing page somewhere? Can they do like, what is cost effective way for people who just want to test the waters? Sure. Um, so there's a couple of different routes I think that, that you can take um, for somebody who's, who's really, really just getting started. I think if you have the time and you're the type of person that's savvy enough, go the DIY approach, um, go with a square space, go with something like that. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't personally, it's been a long time since I've built a website on one of those platforms. I think Squarespace is a, a pretty decent one. Um, so like at the very bottom cost level, like do it yourself, start thinking about a website, build a website, go out with your iPhone, take some pictures of your property, put them up, start to think through, you know, the content list, honestly, like the most important thing is making sure everything's there. So like, make sure you've got a page that shows all the things you want to talk about. You can do that yourself. Um, I would say on the website, that's like the, the bare cost, bare minimum. Um, as far as building a brand, the, um, the strategy stuff, a lot of times there's exercises you can find yourself and it, it's, it, there's kind of workshop things that you can think through making sure, do you have your buyer perform? Like, have you thought through a buyer persona and who you want to sell to? If you haven't. It helped us a lot with this. Like when we, we did like a brainstorm, like I had never really thought about this in depth, like until you did. So I think finding people like you also. Um, <laughs> sure. Helpful. Well, truthfully, honestly, on that level, we do, I mean, we offer 30 minute consultations for free. We're obviously available to kind of help start somebody down the path um, and, and, and give advice and recommendations. We do that all the time and, and are happy to do that for anybody um, who's kind of just getting started and wants to figure out what those things are they should be thinking about. Um, we're available to kind of be an advisor in that way. Um, I think that on the, on the brand strategy side, a lot of that is, is, is exercises you can go through yourself to think through um, making sure that you're doing the due diligence to make sure you know who you want to sell to and you're intentionally trying to target that person. There's tons of freelancers who are artists who are looking for work that can make you a new logo. Um, depending who you find depends on how it will be. Um, but there's lots of cost effective ways. I mean, if you have a graphic designer friend and you have a proper, like go for it, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if you're just getting started, if you're investing a ton of money, you might want to go with somebody who's a little bit more established so you can rely on what, you know, you can have a little more faith in the results you're going to get. Um, but if you're just getting started, the risk is also pretty low. Like if you just have a, a, a fourplex, no one's going to expect you to have a luxury brand that comes off as being this super high end thing. So like, if you have a website, you're probably doing better than the other fourplexes down the road. <laughs> like, you know, so that's awesome. So do it. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, it's kind of the, the steps of like, do what you can, 
do it, go for it. Try to keep things streamlined across your platforms. That's one of the big things is, you know, pick a font, pick a brand color, pick, pick the way you're going to talk about things, some certain phrases or taglines and create some repetition. Um, those are things that anybody can do on social media and across their things themselves. Um, another thing that I would add to as kind of a DIY tool for production for social media and, and otherwise actually is Canva. And Jaffe could speak to this probably the best out of anybody on this call because um, he's a pro at it. But basically what, what it allows you to do is it allows non-graphic designers to have access to graphic design resources or tools um, online for very low cost or free. Um, and so Jaffe, you know, basically has become a graphic designer. You can speak to this, Jaffe. In yeah, it's, it's really simple to use. Even if you don't have any experience with graphic design, um, they have templates where you can literally, literally just go in, type your brand name and your message and change some colors if you want. And you have an ad, a professional looking ad that you can put on social media, Facebook, Instagram. You can, if you just do a Facebook ad or a, a Facebook graphic, you can change the size really easily so that it would fit for any other social media platform with just the click of a button. It's really easy to use. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Well, it's also pretty good with the uh, It's literally my favorite thing ever. Yeah. It's and it's a, woman, it's a woman who started it. So I love you more. Girl power. Yes, it is. She's great. <laughs> um, Bernie has one, another question. Um, if he's not artistic, but wants a branding campaign, how do you go about starting with someone like him? Do you ask certain questions? Do you go by a customer demographic? What else? No idea of font, branding, color, images, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um, the, all of those decisions are strategic decisions that um, could be guided by somebody with a design background who could give you some advice. So the idea is those decisions are not based on you personally. They're based on the audience you're trying to attract. So um, picking, when I say pick a font, um, there, there are certain fonts that might elicit a, a much older, more traditional feeling or fonts that would make uh, uh, something feel much younger and fresher. Um, the, those are things that if you work with a designer to build a logo, they would definitely be able to give insight and, and advice on, on that piece. And kind of same thing with colors, color theory. Um, what types of colors are you, are you going for to give a feeling? The key tower example is black and gold and, and dark grays. Um, extremely high end, extremely a luxury brand that is not going to be approachable necessarily or feel warm. Um, but that's what they wanted. They wanted to be a Midwest luxury brand. That's what we created. Um, I think there's ways to create not luxury brands for buildings that are very warm and welcoming um, and they would not be black and gold. And so I think that, you know, as a real estate person, you may need to engage with a designer um, to kind of get some input. But the idea would be to, you know, if you're not hiring an agency, you may need to guide some of those conversations. So the idea is to say, Hey, I want to hire you to, to, you know, do a logo, but I also want to pick some colors. I want to pick some, I want to pick a font. I want to pick, you know, I want to build a brand and, and helping you kind of know what to ask for. I think it's all about how you want the people to feel. That's what you really explained to us. Dan. It's like the people that, first of all, who are you trying to target? And then when they see this, how do they want to feel when they see it? You know, do they want to see a high end luxury, like, warm welcoming oh let me just you know jump right in here and see what's going on it's very different and, for each property and it's good because in real estate you have a class b class c class d class properties so it's it's kind of clear cut with not, i don't say clear cut but like a class you're talking about very luxury doesn't need to be necessarily like standoffish but like b class c class i don't say they're about the same but you can kind of put a blanket around those different affordable but nice exactly those different uh, ranges yeah yep You answered all of our other questions. Yeah, Mr. I was looking Solo. through it. That was it. <laughs> awesome. I th did something just come in? I thought I just saw one in chat. Nope. Okay. Well, there's no other questions. I think this was awesome. Um, 
I'm super excited with everything we got to cover. Um, like I mentioned, we, you know, the 30 minutes is a rough 30 minutes. If you guys are, are on this and are looking to have a conversation, get some support, some help, just talk through the next steps. Absolutely no strings attached consultations available. That's my email address. I'd be happy to connect with any of you and, and, and just talk through, you know, definitely don't need to feel like you're going to hire me just to get some advice. Um, very available to do that. Tom and Lauren, very available for investment opportunities, anything real estate related. They're actively super hustling in Cleveland. Um, so I'm sure they'd love to connect as well. I don't know if you guys have anything to close with. <laughs> No, thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. You know, so well, everyone hating on me for getting a set up, Jack. We really appreciate it. Um, no, I mean, this was great. I think we should definitely continue to do some more of these. I think there's a ton of value in something that's yeah. so overlooked in the industry, yeah. but so, so, so important. Yep. Maybe yep. We'll have to do it again. This is awesome. Yeah, worth the money. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. It was, uh, it was great having you, and we hope to have you at the next one. We'll be uh, planning one here ASAP for you. <laughs> Thanks, Talk everyone. to you all soon. Thanks, Thanks Matt. guys. Thanks, Matt. Bye. You're welcome.